Hi, I'm Brianna. Welcome to Decoding Physiology. This is a new series that we're doing here at Decoding DX, where we will focus on the phys and pathophys of various entities that we see in clinical practice, because we believe that if you understand the why, you'll know it in the long term and you'll be able to make better decisions for your patients. For our first video, we're going to be talking about metabolic acidosis. So to start out, we have to talk about the daily acid load. This is pretty simple. It's just how much acid your body produces from normal metabolic processes every day. And we can estimate the amount as about one millimole per kg per day. And the important thing to note is that that's how much acid needs to be buffered in your blood in order to keep your pH normal. So this means that we consume about the equivalent amount of bicarbonate, which is the most prominent buffer in our blood. Speaking of bicarbonate, quick little refresher. This is the chemical equation that bicarbonate undergoes in our body. In the normal state, bicarbonate is really important, so it's recycled, but we have to remember that one millimole per kg per day is consumed to buffer that daily acid load. How do we recycle it? Well, the kidneys, of course. Pretty much all of the bicarbonate that is filtered into a healthy nephron is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. And then in the distal nephron, new bicarbonate is produced to replace the bicarbonate that was consumed in buffering that daily acid load. See our follow-up video on renal tubular acidosis for more on these concepts. Let's talk about the anion gap. Sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate. But what does this actually mean? We use this calculation in clinical practice all the time, but we may not completely understand what it's indicating. So this comes down to electron neutrality. The anion gap, sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate, is actually telling us about the unmeasured anions minus the unmeasured cations. The major anions are albumin and phosphate and then any other organic anions in the blood, and the unmeasured cations include a variety of things like immunoglobulin and other metals. What we really care about, though, is not this portion of sodium. Okay, so sodium minus chloride plus bicarb is this excess amount of sodium, but because of electroneutrality, that's telling us about the amount of unmeasured anions, and that's the part that we actually care about. So if we have an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis. What does this mean? Well, what we're calculating is that sodium minus chloride plus bicarb, but what we actually care about is that degree of unmeasured anions. That amount has increased, which tells us that there's something contributing to that increase that's not normally there. There are various different mnemonics to give you a differential of what that could be. Anything from lactic acid to keto acids to ingested acids. But what's important is that the anion gap is a surrogate marker, telling us that there's something that is tipping that electroneutrality balance in the blood. When we have a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, that part that we calculate, the sodium minus chloride plus bicarb, is the same. So that tells us that the amount of unmeasured anions is also the same. But what's different in this case is that the bicarbonate has decreased. So there's not an excess amount of acid in the blood, but there's less of the buffer bicarbonate. So what's normal for the anion gap? Well, there's a variety of different things that can uh, change what the anion gap should be, including albumin and phosphate. But what's important to know is that it depends on your lab. It depends on the specific assay that they have. And so use the reference range that your lab uses in general cases. But then you have to adjust that reference value for albumin. Albumin is the major anion in your blood. And so if albumin is off or abnormal, then that changes the expected anion gap. The quickest and I think easiest way to do this is to just multiply the measured albumin by three, and that's your expected anion gap. This is really important because a lot of our patients in the hospital have pretty low albumins because they're critically ill, and we know that albumin is a negative acute phase reactant, meaning that it goes down in the setting of inflammation. In these cases, what would be a normal anion gap might actually be high. For example, if their albumin is two, their expected anion gap would be three times two or six. And so if they had a measured anion gap of, say, 14, that might not flag as abnormal in your EMR. But in reality, that is an elevated anion gap for that patient. And one quick little pearl here, a low anion gap means that you have excess cations. In these states, you should consider high immunoglobulin states, such as multiple myeloma. So talking about the differential for metabolic acidosis, let's start out with the anion gap side. This can also be abbreviated as HAGMA, which means high anion gap metabolic acidosis. One of the biggest ways that you can get an anion gap is from excess acid. This can be either from ingested or produced acids. You can also get this from kidney failure. That typically doesn't happen until the GFR gets down below 40. And the reason for this is because you simply can't excrete that normal daily acid load that we talked about. And so those acids accumulate in the blood.
on the non-ionogap side, one of the big causes is renal loss of bicarbonate. You can have various types of renal tubular acidoses. And again, see our follow-up video on RTAs for more about these different topics. And then lastly, you can have a GI loss of bicarbonate. This can come from all sorts of issues such as diarrhea, post-op patients with surgical drains, and various medications. So why do we care? Why does acidosis cause so many problems? Well, our bodies are finely tuned to have a very narrow homeostatic range when it comes to pH. When that pH is off, it causes various problems with enzymes and other processes. Some of the big ones to be aware of are cardiovascular and metabolic. So the cardiovascular system is very dependent on pH, and when that pH is low, it can affect your contractility, your blood pressure, and your arterial dilation. It also makes the cardiovascular system less responsive to the normal measures that we use to correct these things. There are lots of other systemic and metabolic issues that are direct results of the acidosis, such as hyperkalemia from intracellular shifts. And lots of enzymes are very, very sensitive to pH. So if that pH is off, it can affect all of those various metabolic processes. So if the problem is acidosis, then why can't we just replace the bicarbonate? Why can't we just neutralize the acid and have all of our problems solved? Well, there's a lot of reasons. We're gonna go through a few here one by one. So to start off with, bicarbonate neutralizes acid, but it also increases carbon dioxide by the simple balance of the chemical equation. In a normal state, blood flow is adequate to remove that excess carbon dioxide, and it's not really a problem. When the blood is flowing well, it takes the carbon dioxide away, and thus the carbon dioxide is able to get out of the blood. But when we have acidemia, remember we talked about the cardiovascular effects, and that causes vasodilation and just poor circulation in general. So that excess carbon dioxide isn't removed anymore. Suddenly it's starting to build up, and if the diffusion gradient is off because of the buildup of CO2 in the arterioles, that means it's going to stay in the cells and build up there, which causes an intracellular acidosis. So even though you've given bicarbonate in the blood, it may show that your pH is normal on your ABG, but inside your cells, it's an acidotic state, and that's impairing all of your metabolic enzymes. Second reason is that bicarbonate directly binds calcium. This is pretty simple. You bind up calcium, you get hypocalcemia. A third reason is that the bicarbonate that we have in the hospitals is very, very concentrated. So in order to give large quantities of bicarbonate, we have to dilute it in a very significant amount of fluid. And so any of our patients that have troubles handling fluids are going to have a lot of problems if we try and give them this much fluid. This includes patients with CHF, nephrotic syndrome, liver failure, and various other hemodynamic problems. A fourth reason is that we can get an acute respiratory alkalosis, and I'm gonna walk through the steps of how this happens. So let's say we have an acidemia and we have some sort of process decreasing the pH in the blood. The medulla is the area of the brainstem that senses this pH and tells the lungs to compensate by increasing ventilation. Let's say we give some supplemental bicarbonate to neutralize that acid in the blood. The bicarbonate is going to convert into CO2 and water as it neutralizes that acid. So we've gotten our pH down in the blood. Awesome, we're back to our normal pH. However, there's a problem. The CO2 that the bicarb became can diffuse into the medulla, but the bicarbonate itself cannot. And so what the medulla sees acutely is the normal amount of acid plus extra CO2. And it interprets this as a metabolic plus a respiratory acidosis. And it causes an excess intracellular acidosis which then tells the lungs even more to increase ventilation. So you're gonna be blowing off extra CO2, even though the pH in your blood is normal, causing an acute respiratory alkalosis. Finally, we can have a late onset rebound metabolic alkalosis. And to explain this, I'm gonna use the example of lactic acidosis. So let's say we have a systemic infection. As a result of that, we produce excess lactic acid. This causes acidemia in our blood, and various other issues with systemic infection. We're gonna treat the patient, we're gonna give them IV antibiotics, we're gonna give them time, we're gonna give them fluids, and eventually that acidosis is going to resolve when the infection resolves. We're going to metabolize that lactate back to pyruvate and we'll have a normal pH in the blood. But let's step back a minute and say that in the state of acidemia, we decided to give supplemental bicarbonate. We give the bicarbonate, it neutralizes a lot of that acid, and we get down to a normal pH in the blood. Our ABG is pretty and we're happy. But you can't forget that you're going to have the conjugate base of the lactate. So we had lactic acid, which degenerated into 
hydrogen ion plus lactate. If we then take that hydrogen ion and neutralize it with the bicarbonate, we still have that lactate left over. Well, we're still gonna treat the patient for what was the cause. So if it was an infection, we're gonna give them the antibiotics, the fluids, the time, and we're gonna fix the infection. But after that, we still have all this lactate left over that we need to metabolize. That's gonna metabolize in the liver. But in order to metabolize it, we have to use hydrogen ions. Well, where are those hydrogen ions gonna come from? The normal supply in the blood. So if we then have a normal pH in the blood, but then we suck up a bunch of the hydrogen ions to metabolize that lactate, we have a metabolic alkalosis left over. And to note, this can happen with all sorts of conjugate bases, lactate, beta hydroxybutyrate, and other things. So when do we even give bicarbonate? If there's all these issues, why is it even an option? It's a long answer. The answer basically is there are a lot of unique situations. The patient will likely need to be in the ICU and it's a bit beyond the scope of this talk. One thing to note is there are some good studies showing that acute kidney injury can uniquely benefit from bicarbonate supplementation. But again, if you're in this situation, you need to be talking to your pharmacist, very carefully monitoring your patient and do a lot of careful calculations with close monitoring from your attending. And then as another aside, in chronic acidosis, which is normally a non-anion gap acidosis from things like renotubular acidosis, you do give supplemental bicarbonate as the run of the mill treatment. Again, we'll talk about this with the follow-up video. So some big key points. The anion gap is simply a surrogate marker for unmeasured anions. The anion gap normal range depends on albumin and other factors in the laboratory. So make sure you use your lab's reference range and adjust for albumin. A high anion gap metabolic acidosis can come from excess acid ingestion, production, or retention. And a non-anion gap acidosis can come from GI or renal mishandling of that bicarbonate. Acidosis causes all sorts of systemic malfunctions, which is why we care about it so much. But there are very few situations where you want to give supplemental bicarbonate because of various risks associated with it. Only in severe cases of acute anion gap met metabolic acidosis and then routinely in chronic acidosis. Here are some references. Thank you so much for joining us on our very first episode of Decoding Physiology. We hope you enjoyed it and we'll be following up with more series soon.